Got my coffee ready, so for this, um, so at the moment, I am actually just sharpening my tools, so, uh, and I'm setting up, mm -hmm. I'm working on setting up a Pierre Lamont Master violin, um, to, yeah, just to get it into a good, really good condition. How's everyone going? Is any, you seeing any comments? Am I live? Can you see me? All oh, right. Is it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. All right. Fantastic. Um. So, got my coffee. Very important. Mm. It's sort of a bit weird. I can't see all the questions. Uh, there we go. You need to turn that down. Please, I'm up the Sorry, I'm going to have to go. Okay. All right. Let's get started. So at the moment, I am sharpening my tools uh, because I'm cutting a bridge. Uh, so I thought I might just work on a bridge while we chat. And... Uh, I think um, I've actually gotten a whole lot of questions from you guys. It's pretty exciting. Um, uh, the unfortunate thing is I can't see the chat coming up. So um, we, um, so I'm, I'm kind of working blind here. I don't know why it's it's like the app. Ooh, I just oh look at that. Um, oh yeah, there it is. Yay! It happened. Good evening. Okay. Fantastic. Now I can see everything. I have a huge finger. <laughs> oh no, now it disappeared again. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. I haven't done this in a while, so just bear with me. I'll probably, you know, <laughs> talk all sorts of rubbish every now and then. Mm. But yes, thanks so much for the question. So today, the big focus will be the um, will be you guys. Um, it, it'll all be about like the setup of an instrument, how well it's working, and things like that. My app isn't working properly, so I can't see any of your comments coming in. Um, hopefully, you will read them to me every now and then, Coralie. Um, yeah, so. Um, is there a way, like, could I use your phone and that way I can see with the chat and that way I can see the comments? Or do you want to use your phone and I'll use the uh, tablet? All right, just pass the tablet over here. Just unplug it. I'm just, uh, it's going to be weird. I'm going to see myself twice. But I'm just going to move the tablet here so I can see the questions. Because, where's the stand? Um, start with the question. Yeah, thank you. Start with the question. Awesome. All right. Let's get into it. So I've had lots of questions. Uh, at the moment, I am working on a bridge. Um, and I've had, yeah, I've had lots and lots of comments. So, um, so I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to answer, which question will I answer? The general question. Read the question to me. What's the best? I was going to do that a bit later because um, when there's more people on the chat, so that's yeah. No, okay, fantastic. Um, so I've had lots of different questions. Um, so at the uh, there's one like how dramatic can a good bridge shape change the playability? Uh, my violin bridge is very sloped and it's actually harder to play than my old bridge, which is less curved. Um, okay, let's have a think. So play bridge is really important in playability. I'm always very, very fussy. There's, there's a few things. There's obviously the curve, uh, which is this curve. Um, I use a template for my curve to make sure that it's 100% right. And that template's been worked out that when you're playing with the bow, that 
as you're going across that you don't have to move the bow too far to change strings, but that it's not too close that you end up playing more than um, more than one string. So when the when the um, curvature is really flat, you play basically more than one string at a time. Um, but also you have the um, the problem uh, if it's too round, you you know, like you're you're really pumping and it's really hard work. So it has to have this beautiful balance. But also I'll do some flatter bridges sometimes for folk players because they want to play more double stops and it's actually quite especially like bluegrass and that kind of stuff. And uh, and so I'll actually do a flatter bridge for that. That way you can play lots of double stops. Um, Irish music, the flatter flatter bridge is really good for Irish music as well. Um, the other thing about the bridge is um, we'll talk about sound. It actually has a very big effect on the sound as well. Um, so the big things to watch out for the bridge are firstly the curvature then how high the strings are off the fingerboard. Um, for violin, you're looking at about between five and five and a half millimeters on the G and between three and three and a half millimeters on the E string. I work in millimeters uh, having kind of grown up around Europe. Um, then the string spacing from side to side is about 34 millimeters. And it has to be very evenly spaced. Um, if it gets much wider, it actually affects the tone. Um, but yeah, that's how the bridge affects playability mostly. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, I, I currently I'm, I'm going to be totally lost if you do that. Um, all right. Um, how do you know what strings make the best sound on an instrument? It's a trial and error situation. Um, you know, you, you want to use it. You want to always start with a good quality strings string. I'm a fan of Perestro strings. Um, they've basically um, <clears throat> they've been making strings since the 1700s and they know their stuff. Um, apparently Paganini bought his strings. They were two, like, um, Perestros, actually, two companies. I uh, can't quite remember. Like, it's made up of, of two names, a, a Swiss name and an Italian name. And as far as I know, um, as far as I know, Paganini actually bought um, bought the strings off, um, off the Italian company, and he used to destroy any bad strings and pay for them. So no violinist was left um, with bad strings. But, I, you know, there's a lot of legend around Paganini, so you never know what's true. Um, so just start with, with generally good quality strings. Go with companies that are well known. Um, I have not come across any Chinese brand strings that have excited me as yet. I mean, that could, that could change with research and things like that. Uh, so I'm a fan of, uh, for violin, I'm a fan of Perestro and Tomestic strings. Uh, also Dario do some good stuff. Um, and then uh, for cello, also really like Larsen strings. Um, yeah, so you, you just got to use some good quality, basically good quality strings. Uh, <clears throat> and then play around, you know, there's strings with a more mellow sound, a brighter sound, and there's these beautiful charts um, it, that, that, that tell you the different kinds of sounds. Uh, yeah, it's quite interesting, like whether it's more mellow, sharper, more, um, yeah, there's all these different things in the charts. All right, um, what's the next question that I'm... Oh, right. The difference between aluminium, steel and gold. It's on the violin. Um, as, uh, there's different windings for each string just to... Um, so the G is usually a silver winding. Uh, I think G and D are actually silver winding. I'm fairly certain. 
uh, than the AS, often aluminium winding, and, and I think the lighter, lighter metal actually creates a better kind of a sound, but I'm not, you know, I'm not a string maker or string specialist, I just use them. And then there is the, um, then there's the plain steel string. So uh, um, that um, for the E and a lot of people like just the plain steel E that sounds really nice. Uh, the problem with aluminium is it wears out really quickly and especially if you've got slightly more acidic perspiration. So some everyone sweats a little bit differently. And if it's a little bit more acidic, you will destroy um, aluminium strings really quickly. So a good way of saving your strings or looking after your strings is to um, to actually wipe them down after playing all the time, um, always wipe them down after playing. And you could probably even use a very, very, like if you've got really bad perspiration, you may be able to use a very slightly damp cloth to wipe over them just to get rid of the acid. And then, uh, and, and we're not talking, so just wipe down the strings like with water where your hands go. So do, do, could you grab me that first violin, please, Carly? Um, so, um, so your hands usually don't make it much further than here. For me, it's more like here because I'm fairly lazy as a player <laughs> and I don't go up too high, but you know, if you're a good player, you'll get all the way up here. And, uh, and so I would just use a very, very, very lightly damp tissue. Uh, I'm just using a piece of paper towel. I'm kind of wetting it. And then, uh, and then just wetting one side and then I fold it all together. And now it's just very slightly damp. And then I just kind of wipe over the strings. And then I would use a cleaning cloth. Um, and if the cleaning cloth says Olaf Gravert Violin Studio, it works way better than any other cleaning cloths. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I just like ours. Uh, this one's pretty dirty. It's been used a lot. Um, yeah, and then you just dry it off afterwards um, just with a cleaning cloth. Have you got a nice new one? Um, no, right in front of you. Um, okay. um, yeah, so these are my some of my cleaning cloths. I've got different colors to... Um, it took me forever to get the logo right, so it took about three years. <laughs> um, okay, so what's the next question? Um, maybe if you grab this and yeah, okay. Oh, right, yeah, so at the moment I'm setting up a Pierre Lamont Master Violin. Someone asked about the difference between the Pierre Lamont and the Pierre Lamont Master Violin. It's probably not a relevant question to answer with for the setups, but a lot of people have been getting a lot of joy out of my Pierre Lamont violin. So, um, um, yeah, and, and I'm very fussy at, with the setup. Um, so my Pierre Lamont master basically have better materials, uh, so better tone woods. Uh, they have nicer fittings than the Pierre Lamont. So it's got like these pretty fittings. Um, also, if you're after a uh, tail piece um, with just the one fine tuner, it's got the really pretty tail piece. I think I've got one here, like like this. But I quite often I'll actually put on a normal um, a fine tuning tail piece as well. Um, a lot of people who play the Pierre Lamont instruments are actually um, hobby players, and uh, they're really beautiful instruments for hobby players. Um, and so uh, they, you know, quite often I'll put on a fine tuning tail piece just to make life easier for a player. You don't want to spend hours tuning. I mean, these pegs, uh, they've been really beautifully, um, like these pegs are beautifully fitted, so they turn very smoothly. But still, it can be a little bit hard sometimes because they're not quite as even. even. All right, we have another question. Let's answer, make sure all the yellow questions get answered. Yeah. Um, Actually, can I just grab it? I'm just going to do, I'm just literally going to read through these questions really quickly and I'm just going to fire off answers. Okay. Uh, what kind of strings would make the best sound? We've got that. Um, 
how dramatic can yep how do you use different styles of chin rests and okay so there's lots of different chin rests <clears throat> Uh, I've got two questions actually. One is the different shapes of chin rests, and the other one is how do you know what the best combination of chin rest shoulder rest is? Um, so, um, um, uh, so the most important thing about a chin rest and shoulder rest is comfort. So you want to be as comfortable as possible. Um, so I, you know, a lot of, uh, so you have different kinds of chin rest. The chin rest on this instrument here is the Tekka shaped chin rest. And uh, uh, this is my Giorgiani violin, by the way. It's got a beautiful back. It's around, I think around 7,000 Australian dollars. Um, at the moment, the Australian dollars is, dollar is worth very little, so it's probably only about 4,000 US dollars or five, four, between four and five. Um, but the, um, so the chin rest, this is the Tekka chin rest. It works quite well for a lot of players. I personally like it. You've also got the Guarneri chin rest, which is the one that is on the Pierlemont Master that I'm currently sitting on, uh, setting up. I'm not sitting on the violin. Um, and, uh, and that's also quite comfortable. The chin often ends up closer to the tailpiece. Um, but then the shoulder rest as well. So the, the most important thing is that your neck, your spine is always straight. And you can find that out by looking into the mirror while you're playing or filming yourself. You know, it's probably best to film yourself on the side or set up the camera and, and literally just turn around so you can see all of yourself. And you don't want to be leaning because anytime your head leans while you're playing, you basically, you're, you're putting some extra tension on the other side. Mm. And so, um, yeah, so you definitely don't want to put too much tension on your neck or your spine. Um, it's, it's not as bad if you're a hobby player because you're just not playing for as long, but if you're playing, you know, like if you're a professional, you have to be so careful about your setup. You have to get it just right. And whether it is, um, could you pass me two, um, uh, Kun shoulder rests, please. Um, just the one that's sort of readily available there for starters. Just give that to me now. Thank you. This does it, oh, this doesn't have the extended feet. Okay, so um, one, do, we don't have one with extended feet, do we? Um, so I really like the Kun shoulder rest. There's lots of different shoulder rests. Uh, what I like about it is that it um, that it actually turns. You you can turn it from side to side. Not all of them, but but. Uh, some of them and so they they work for probably about 90% of people you can also get extender legs to make it taller so I've got clients with quite long necks with you know like everyone's different you know some people have shorter necks some people have longer necks some people have shoulders that that are just straight across like me some people have shoulders that slope down a lot and people that have longer necks and shoulders that slope down a lot are the hardest to get comfortable on an instrument because you've got to you've got to put a lot of height here, and so quite often I do that by um, like I've got chin rests that are extra high. Can you pass me an extra high chin rest? Um, that uh, you know that that creates extra. Yep. Yeah. So this is like the, the. Do you have a short one as well? This is like a um, Tekka chin rest that I've had made with some extra height. Um, and then I've got just the normal, that doesn't have anything. Yeah. Then I've just got the normal ones that are, um, here we go. So there's the normal ones and there's the ones with the extra height. Yeah. And uh, and so that can really help. The higher chin rest can help. There's also the SAS chin rest that's really good uh, for some players. It's very small, the surface is quite small but you can tilt it in different directions. It doesn't often, the, the other thing about a chin rest, you wanna make sure that it gives you a bit of, <clears throat> a bit of an, a lift here so that, that you, it hooks underneath your jaw a little bit and gives you some extra, um, extra support. Um, so yeah, the important thing, straight neck, and you have to be very comfortable. Also the wolf uh, shoulder mm -hmm. rest can be really good. Um, 
because uh, with the wolf shoulder rest, actually the wolf forte secondo, you can, uh, the, the pad here is actually made of quite a thin steel and you can actually bend it to the shape of your shoulder. But uh, you've got to be a bit careful. I've, I've seen people try to do it and they've ended up with some really intricate sculptures that did very little for their shoulders. So, so it's a little bit more tricky. You might want to do it together with your teacher or someone who's professional. The other one is the, um, what's that tall sh shoulder rest that we have? The um, It's just if you look through there, I think it's third one down third or fourth one down. Uh, bon Musica, that's it, I've got it. Yeah, so the Bon Musica shoulder rest is one where you can get a whole lot of extra height. Um, and also it, it wraps around the shoulder, so it gives you a lot of support. So that's really good for people with posture problems. Um, I don't like it as much because it doesn't give you a lot of freedom to move around, but, uh, but sometimes that can be, um, you know, just having just having that extra support can be really good. Okay, I think that's enough on the uh, shoulder rest, chin rest. Um, have we had any questions come through while... Well, there's people from Chicago about that gear, what your opinion on gear pegs. Gear pegs? Look, I don't care either way. Um, <laughs> so, so so there's some, some very, you know, sometimes people have very passionate discussion about some of these things. Um, for me, it's all about making playing easier. I'm, I'm the same. I have no, you know, I don't mind whether you use a, a tailpiece with one fine tuner or, or a tailpiece with four fine tuners. Um, it's, um, you know, whatever makes your playing easiest. That's the most important thing. Um, the, the important thing is that you don't put four fine tuners on a timber tailpiece because each fine tuner weighs quite a lot and it makes it really heavy. And uh, whereas like these Whitner ultralight tailpieces, they've been engineered to be an exact combination of weights that uh, that's the equivalent of a normal tailpiece with one fine tuner. The hell, it'll dampen the sound. All right, what's the next question? Oh yes, so um, we're going to talk about changing the sound now. I had a question here. Um, what is the most important thing to change on the violin to get the best possible sound? Strings, the bridge, uh, sound pose. And for me, it's very much a combination. I always work on the combination. There's, there's um, the first thing is that the the fingerboard projection has to be right. So, so what that means, if the fingerboard pro projection is right, it gives you the right string height. Uh, the right, sorry, not the right string height, the right bridge height. And when the bridge has the correct height, it has the right amount of pressure onto the top plate. So you're aiming for about seven, uh, 27 kilos of weight onto the top plate, which is a lot of weight if you think, you know, like 27 kilos. I don't know if you watched that two set video where we put 27 kilos on top of a violin. It's kind of cool and freaked us all out. But um, um, so that's the first thing. You need to make sure that the fingerboard projection is right so you have enough pressure on the top plate. Then the next thing, the shape of the bridge, um, uh, shape and the thickness of the bridge, um, is really important. A lot of makers make the bridge very thin at the top. And what happens is that, that the sound, uh, because the strings vibrate, when the bridge is really, really thin at the top, you actually lose some of that vibration just in the bridge itself because it's a bit too wobbly. So then the bridge passes the, um, the vibration down onto the top plate. So, so I always look at that combination of the bridge and then it goes down onto the top plate and through the top plate uh, using the sound post. So the next one is the sound post adjustment. Um, so the sound post adjustment is really important as well. Not just the adjustment of the sound post, but also the length and thickness of the sound post. So if a sound post is too long, it's jammed in there really hard and it will actually stop the plates from vibrating as freely as they should. Uh, but then you can get the um, 
uh, then you can uh, go the other way and make it too loose and then you know firstly it risks it falling over easily but then also it uh, it you know it may not be good for the sound either so you've got to get this balance just right um, so for me it's not just one thing I always look at an instrument really holistically uh, there's also about the sound I mean the whole shape of an instrument um, creates um, you know it's what creates a sound character of an instrument and so someone asked what's better Guarnerius or Stradivarius shape or or you know or is there even a difference there is a huge difference so the shape and there are a lot of other shapes than just the Guarnerius and Stradivarius shapes uh, but but the shape, you know, the size, the, the the combination of how big the bottom bouts are, the top bouts are, and the C bouts are, and where the F holes sit and how they're carved makes a huge difference to the sound. And then you've got the arching as well. The arching on the top plate is very different to the arching on the back. But then you've got the thickness of the plates again. So there are so many variables that affect the tone. And... Uh, a lot of violin making schools don't actually teach those variables and those things. They teach teach makers or up and coming makers to make really beautiful, you know, beautifully crafted instrument, but not necessarily um, not necessarily teach that much about sound. And there are actually not that many people that know that much about the sound. Uh, next question. How do you know you need to service your instrument and <clears throat> and uh, how often should you do it? Um, I usually, like if you're just playing every now and then, um, uh, I usually suggest between, you know, one and two years uh, have your, your instrument. It's it's good to actually get your instrument professionally checked once a year. It's, it's absolutely worth it, even if you're not playing it. Um, but then uh, if you're playing less, it might be just once every two years, might be fine. And um, I've got players who need to get their instrument service once every six months. And mm. uh, they do a whole lot of practice, a whole lot of, um, yeah, a whole lot of playing. So they need to get their instrument service, yeah, every six months. And, uh, you know, soloists, for example, um, I, I work with some soloists and, and some players will need their bows rehaired every five concerts. So, you know, bow rehair won't even last for three weeks sometimes. And <clears throat> same with strings. They'll change strings, uh, you know, every two weeks. Like um, I asked Ray Chen if he could send me, he sent me his um, string change schedule. Uh, he keeps meticulous record of when he changes strings and he'll just change one string at a time as it wears out. And his strings last about two weeks each, which is crazy. Uh, <clears throat> but a lot of players, you like for a lot of players, you literally don't need to change strings any more than once a year. And if you're playing cello and you've got those tungsten uh, C and G strings, they last forever. They literally last for 10 years. Okay. Um, is that enough uh, for the service? Now I'm I'm, I'm still going about uh, setup. So um, one of the things that's really important in the setup is also the the fingerboard feel. And uh, someone actually asked uh, <clears throat> if we sometimes do a narrower fingerboard for smaller hands or a wider fingerboard. And yes, we do, and that gets done. But it's an irreversible process. Um, so I've got an old French violin. I'll just show you. Um, excuse me. Where's the other half? Okay. All right. So I have this old French violin. And what I'm doing with this violin is I'm actually making a neck graft at the moment. So I'm grafting a new... I'll be I'll be putting a whole new neck on, and and so this this violin did actually have its neck adjusted. It looks so weird without a scroll, doesn't it? I'll, I'll do this so it looks better. <laughs> it's had its neck adjusted. If you, you can actually see how much thinner the neck is, can you hang on? Is it? 
It's hard to see, isn't it? Anyway, it's way thinner, and it's uh, for me, it's actually unplayable. It's so thin. Um, <clears throat> so, so, um, so yes, you can get the neck and fingerboard thin, but think about it very carefully because if you want to resell the violin, you're going to have to find someone to sell it to with small hands. Um, <clears throat> But also, um, also a, the, one of the bigger changes is in the spacing, the string spacing at the nut. Um, I recently um, did an extra wide string spacing at the nut for a player. Um, uh, he actually bought one of the Giordani violins. That's, uh, that's the one I showed you before, this beautiful one. And uh, he... Um, so I did an extra wide string spacing here, and I've I've got pretty big hands as well, you know, German farmer hands, and uh, so so I did a wide string spacing, and I was amazed when I played it. It actually made it so much easier to play double stops. So if you're really struggling, if you've got bigger hands uh, or wider fingers, and you're struggling with double stops, it could have something to do with the adjustment of the width. Um, the string width at the nut. Um, I've just got to top up my glue. My glue is bubbling away here and it's making a very loud noise which always tells me it's time to top up the water. Um, I always keep my glue going. Um, I just realized it's almost impossible for me to work and talk at the same time so it's probably I was gonna just you know finish the bridge finish setting up this beautiful Pierre Lamont violin but it's just not gonna it's not gonna happen I'm sorry because uh, you know I do need to focus on talking to you guys and uh, I really want to make sure that you get as much value as possible out of this so um, um, what haven't I covered what else what other questions do we have So transporting instruments or storing them. Can you read the exact question? I don't have All right. Um, so there was a question about storing instruments and whether you, you to should... To remove the bridge when storing. Or whether to remove the bridge when storing. So if you have a really old instrument uh, that's sort of been... And, and you, mm -hmm. you're literally trying to store it for the next um, 20 years or something like that... Um, then it's a good idea to take the bridge down but um, otherwise um, otherwise you can just loosen the strings a little bit as well um, if if you're transporting an instrument I usually try to send instruments with the bridges on them because I set them up just perfectly and I actually want them to arrive that way and I just put a bit of bubble wrap either side of the bridge um, to protect it just in case it does fall down um, but if you're if you're like traveling with an instrument it's not a good idea to take the bridge down especially if you can take it up you know in the uh, into the um, cabin with you um, yeah Okay, keeping the bridge straight. How do you make sure the bridge stays straight? You just check it regularly. I've done two or even three videos on how to straighten your bridge. So look those up. It's super easy. I tend not to, um, I tend not to loosen the strings to do it. Um, but uh, what's important is you want the, um, you want the bridge to have a, to be at a right angle um there we go hang on a sec so can you see you want the bridge to be very close to a right angle to the this one's leaning a tiny bit hang on a sec i don't maybe i don't have this right there um to the base of the top plate and so you just check it and if it looks like it's leaning back or forward it always looks like it's leaning back very slightly if you just look at it. Uh, then, but if it, if it's say if it's leaning a lot like um, like this, well, oh, I hate doing this. Say it's leaning a lot like that, then you can just um, you, you make sure that you um, push both thumbs together. I've I've showed you many times, and then you can uh, you can 
pop it back over. Oh, someone gave me some money. That's very sweet. Thank you very much. Um, um, <laughs> um, fantastic. All right. Um, yeah, so thanks very much, HPV. I just didn't expect that. <laughs> um, does my son plan? Look, uh, I'm teaching him. I'm teaching my son, uh, you know, some things, you know, while he's still at school. But uh, and and it could be a possibility for him. But I really want to make sure that he explores his options. You know, it's not that easy to learn violin making. And I want to make sure that he's in a career that he's super happy with. So, yeah, I don't know yet. <laughs> Um, okay. Um, did I answer that last question yeah. correctly? Yep. Okay. Um, so what other questions do we have? Does a scroll serve a purpose? Firstly, it's, um, I'm making a scroll for my new violin at the moment. And yes, I am working on a new violin and no, I haven't filmed the process, but I will film the next violin. I promise it's just I've just been so busy so the scroll serves a purpose it actually acts as a bit of a weight at the back here it's actually quite funny if you play a violin without a scroll it actually has a very different sound and uh, it's almost like it over vibrates um, <clears throat> so it does actually serve a purpose like a weight but it's also a place where the violin maker can show off their skills um, <clears throat> and uh, or opposite <laughs> I've seen some pretty rough scrolls um, yeah let me just quickly I just want to make sure that I answer all the questions that people send in earlier um, so let's let's have a quick uh, for cellos for cellos how important is the tailpiece for the sound yes it's uh, <clears throat> it is important to make sure that the tail gut and the weight of the tailpiece that the tail gun length and the weight of the tail bit piece all work nicely together. So you just have to experiment a little bit to, to get the optimal sound. Um, <clears throat> What's the difference between a French and Belgian bridge? Uh, the Belgian, French and Belgian bridges, what's the difference between a French and Belgian bridge on the cello? This is, oh, I just had it here today. I tidied up too much. Um, can you pass me that bridge that's just underneath the scrolls of those instruments there? The cello bridge. So this is a French shape bridge and this one is a Belgian shape bridge. <clears throat> now the Belgian uh, shape bridge has a lot more freedom up here <clears throat> and I often use it to really free up the sound on cellos. I'm a huge fan of Belgian bridges except when a cello works extremely well um, and you almost need to dampen it a little bit. Um, let me just see. <clears throat> now, do, do the different kinds of pegs make a difference? And what's my favorite choice of pegs? I don't have a favorite. I actually look at an instrument, look at the color, look at the, um, look what it looks like. And then I, I <clears throat> go with the pegs that I feel work the best for the instrument. That's for my instruments for sale. And then, you know, it's a very personal choice, but it does not affect the tone a lot, what kind of pegs you have. It's just that the uh, boxwood, so the, the hardest pegs you can get are ebony pegs, and they will they will stay, you know, the way you, can, you like once you cut them, the, the wood is really, really hard. They'll just stay the same almost. Then you have rosewood pegs, which are the, uh, these kinds of pegs that are more kind of a brown color. And rosewood, um, it's a little bit softer. So it'll actually, they'll actually squish in, they'll push through a little bit and you have to readjust them over the years. And then the softest pegs are the boxwood pegs. And, uh, and they, you, you know, like when I fit them, I actually have to fit them longer because I just push into the instrument and condense. Uh, but they have no effect on the tone whatsoever. So if anyone, someone asked if they were getting scammed because someone said rosewood is better. Yeah, definitely. Rosewood is not better. It just looks pretty. Um, sad thing about rosewood is it's actually a fairly rare wood. And... Uh, 
some really clever people, um, I think in China and some areas, decided that rosewood would be lovely to make timber floors out of and literally cut down all these forests for timber floors. And now it's a bit more restricted timber, which is kind of sad. Uh, you can still get it for musical instruments, but it's more restricted than it used to be. Um, <clears throat> some chin rests and shoulder rests are bad for the sound. Uh, they can be if they're really heavy, uh, but you just, just see if it affects the tone. Now I'm going to just have about another five minutes and then I'm going to wrap things up. So I'm just going to very quickly go through through and make sure what I've got. My violin sounds a bit airy. Wood moving the sound post close or the bridge helps. It's so different. Like each instrument is so different. Um, so Simon asked um, if his, you know, the violin sounds a bit airy. Um, it's just so, each instrument is so unique and different. Uh, it's a bit hard to say, how do you choose a good bow? You just try lots of bows and pick the one that feels the best and allows you to sound the best. So you just try the different pieces and see how it makes you feel, how it works. Why do violin bridges warp? They warp because when you're playing and tuning, you, um, as you're tuning with the peg here, I've explained this before, but when you're tuning with the peg, the string pulls this way and it pull, it'll pull the top of the bridge over slowly. So as you're tuning, the, the string will continually stretch throughout its life and it'll get longer and longer. And because there's more string here and less string there, it basically just pulls, slowly pulls the bridge over. So every now and then you just need to straighten it. That's why that happens. Um, by the way, the bridge position should be, see the little nicks? They're not very obvious here. I'll try and find a top plate that's a little bit more obvious. Um, I'm just working on this one. Uh, see the little nicks in the F holes here? Um, they are that the bridge is supposed to sit right in between like if you drew a line from one side to the other the bridge should sit right in the middle uh, however not all violin makers put those little nicks in the right place so it's just a guide and measurement is better um what else do we have yeah yeah <clears throat> I think, yeah, I think um, I might start winding up. Um, but today I'm not answering any questions about being a violin maker because I don't, um, because this is not the purpose of this video. The most important, like a really important thing is a lot of players buy instruments from various shops and a lot of shops just don't take the time to set up an instrument. So I, I go through and I make sure that the fingerboard's plain and it has the right curvature, has the right curvature in this direction as well as in this direction. I also make sure that the nut has the correct shape and that everything's right here. So that gives you a really nice hand feel. I also make sure that the bridge is the right height and the right curvature. That means that the strings the entire way um, the entire way along the instruments, the strings feel just very beautiful and they allow you to play very cleanly and quickly. Um, then I make sure that the pegs work very smoothly. But a lot of shops don't actually do that. And a lot of the way instruments come, especially a lot of instruments these days are made in Chinese workshops and factories. And they don't come in a very playable condition. I've talked about this before, so you can see that in some of my other videos. So the really important thing is to make sure that you get an instrument with a really good setup. And if you're having difficulties, you're finding it hard to play cleanly or something like that, go to your local violin maker and ask, make sure that everything's right. I have done videos where I explain all the measurements of everything. So look those up for, you know, the important thing is that you have a really good setup that helps you to play fast and cleanly because a lot of players end up struggling if something isn't set up well uh, to the point of, um, of actually getting RSI. I've had professional players who've played on badly set up instruments, professional players, 
and they had to give up because of RSI. Um, and, and some professionals, the, the other problem that some professionals have is that they don't have a good chin rest and shoulder rest set up. And the final one that professionals do, and this is really big, playing violin professionally or playing a musical instrument professionally is like an elite sport. What sport do you know where someone holds up something for five, you know, like four to five hours in a day? You know, I don't know of many sports where people do that. That's, you know, that that is a lot of wear and tear. Okay, they're only very small muscle movements, but you need to do something to compensate. So you need to do stretches. Uh, I've talked about it in other videos, like stretches you can do, and you need to take care of your body as well as the instrument. So if you're feeling pain and discomfort while playing, get on top of it early. You don't want to wait till it's too late. I've I've got some clients who are very high up uh, in various orchestras around here that had to give up their career and they are devastated. Um, anyway, so I'm very passionate about setup and that's why I wanted to, to share this. Is there any last questions um, that you think I might just leave it here. So thanks so much for tuning in. Thanks for watching. You guys are, are excellent. I haven't done one of these in a really long time because I had uh, crappy internet. We, we might live in a first world country, but some of our internet has been not so good. But I connected with Starlink recently and it's good. It's working. Thanks, Elon. Um, so, um, so yeah, I'm going to do some more of these lives, but I'm going to try and get like focus on a um, I'll try and focus on various themes each time I will do one for up and coming violin makers because I do get a lot of questions about violin making and violin repairs. Um, uh, anyway, thanks so much for watching. Uh, look after yourself, look after your instrument, play the best possible instrument you can afford so you get joy out of it and uh, i'll see you guys next time thanks so much all right see you guys i am gonna clock off now and i don't know how to do it so um we'll see what happens <laughs> i don't know what button to press i haven't done this in a while but i'll see you in about a month's time huh.